Good afternoon. I'm Kathy Wilson Gould with the Office of Nutrition and Health Promotion Programs at the Administration for Community Living. I'd like to welcome you to our second Thursday at 3 webinar series. Today, the webinar is one of four weekly webinars during the month of March to celebrate our Senior Nutrition Program. The title of today's webinar is Trifecta Part 1, Food Insecurity and Malnutrition. Just a few housekeeping issues. Um, I want to um, let you know that today's webinar is being recorded and it will be available on the ACL website at www.acl.gov backslash senior nutrition. And this is where the entire month's activities and support materials are housed. Also, captioning or cart services are av available for this webinar. The link has been placed in the, the um, chat box. And please direct all questions and inquiries regarding today's presentation, including um, certificates of attendance, if you're in need of one, to Nicole Becerra, so nicole.becerra at acl.hhs.gov. And questions may be submitted up to one week after the webinar. And these questions will be compiled for each speaker. And if you would please, if you would write the speaker's name uh, in the subject line for who the question is intended, this would be extremely helpful. Next slide. All right, we have an excellent program developed for you today. I've spent some time with our network speakers over the last few days, and I'm so impressed with what they've prepared for you. So um, our lineup for today, we're gonna have Judy Simon, our national nutritionist with ACL. She will kick off the webinar, and then we'll roll over and move towards Pam Van Campen. She is the Older Americans Act consultant. She also serves as a nutrition specialist and senior center representative at the Greater Wisconsin Agency on, on Aging Resources. And then we also have with us today Paul Hepfer. He is the chief executive officer of Project Open Hand in San Francisco. And then we'll wrap up with just a few brief um, comments and next steps. Next slide. So our learning objectives today, we're going to distinguish between nutrition and food insecurity. We'll identify the root causes of malnutrition and present innovative approaches to combating malnutrition. And we're also gonna discuss the importance of partnerships and lessons learned. Next slide. So with great pleasure, I want to introduce Judy Simon. Judy, as I mentioned, is our national nutritionist with the Office of Nutrition and Health Promotion Programs. Judy is an incredible, I'm always so impressed with, with Judy's information base. She has an excellent um, presentation prepared for you. So I, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Judy. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks for joining us today. And Nicole, you can keep it on the screen for a minute. Oh, actually, thank you. So during last week's webinar, we began the Celebrate the National Senior Nutrition Program celebration by introducing the idea of valuing each of its three main intents, nutrition, socialization, and health and well-being. Today's focus is on nutrition, including hunger, food insecurity, and malnutrition and it has much to offer. So I urge you to listen for what resonates with you and resolve to take at least one step in a new direction towards addressing the nutritional needs of your participants. To be truthful, the variety and breadth of the information presented today may feel a little overwhelming, but the reason for this is in concert with the variety and breadth of our network. This present presentation is full of gold nuggets. There will be pieces in this presentation your organization can do and others you may feel are not good fits. 
After this webinar, we encourage you to go to the Celebrate the National Senior Nutrition Program webpage to review the incredible tools offered and also download this PowerPoint, look up one of the resources noted, maybe reach out to one of the speakers to learn more, or perhaps forward the recording link to a key person in your or a partner's organization. We have one presenter today, Pam, who will share her perspective about malnutrition. She is a national champion in this area and has been building her community-focused vision and tools for over many years. Another speaker, Paul, will be discussing food as medicine services, which typically involves integrating with healthcare as well as community-based programming. You can build your approach to addressing malnutrition and food insecurity one step at a time. Know that each of our experts have built their programs by collaborating and learning from others. You're not alone. We have an entire national network we are celebrating this month, offering the Senior Nutrition Program. The flavors may vary, but keep in mind there are many others in your same situation who you can learn from and who can offer you support and guidance. Next slide. Malnutrition was newly added to the 2020 reauthorization of the Older Americans Act. Screening for malnutrition is included as part of nutrition screening within broader routine health screenings that occur. And the reauthorization also added reducing malnutrition to the purpose of the nutrition services programs. Next slide. Malnutrition is different than food insecurity. Malnutrition is a, it's a clinical condition that requires a dietitian or a physician to diagnose. This slide shows the six components for diagnosing malnutrition, and two are needed for someone to be identified or diagnosed as having malnutrition. Food insecurity is when someone is without reliable access to enough affordable, culturally appropriate, and nutritious food. Thankfully, you can screen for both malnutrition and food insecurity. Screening is a tool that uses just a few simple questions to see if someone is at risk. It's not a diagnosis. It simply indicates someone has a risk which needs further attention. There are falls risk screenings, depression screens, and malnutrition and food insecurity screens, among many others. The good news is that anyone provided basic training can do screening. The key is to ensure they know the appropriate supports and referrals to make in case someone screens positive so we can address any identified risk situation appropriately. Next slide. So why are food insecurity and malnutrition part of our responsibility? Let me share some reasons. First, the Older Americans Act tells us that Aging Network's mission is to maximize the independence, well-being, and health of older adults. You know your, your clients well, you provide person-centered approaches, and because of that, you are an important part of identifying and addressing malnutrition and food insecurity. Malnutrition is more common than we realize and causes significant risk for illness, falls, and poor quality of life. We'll be sharing more about that in detail later. It often goes undetected, but there are signs that can be identified in the community, which means that you can help prevent these negative outcomes. The Net Aging Network provides services that address the social determinants of health, such as transportation, food access, and physical activity to build strength and to help manage chronic conditions. These issues contribute to malnutrition and food insecurity risk. Combining healthcare in partnership with community-based organizations can comprehensively help older adults. Partnerships to manage transition of care from the hospital into the community are vitally important. Next slide. The next few slides share pieces of a tool from one of ACL's Innovation and Nutrition grantees, the Maryland Department of Aging. Their toolkit for area agencies on aging to address malnutrition is a document any organization can use and customize to meet their needs. 
It will be posted on the Celebrate the National Senior Nutrition Program website in the near future, and good news, it'll be posted as a Word document. This table lays out a simplified plan of establishing validated screening tools that are used during client intake. As I said, screening can be accomplished once someone is given a brief training. So you can choose a screening tool that fits your clients, your organization, or partner organizations. Sometimes it's helpful to use the same tool as your partner, let's say a hospital, so results can be compared. Other times, you can choose your own, and it's, it's fine with your partners. Then comes your area of expertise, identifying programs and services to address a person's needs, and this can be done in addition to referring someone to their physician or dietitian. And the last phase is monitoring progress and ensuring the quality of the service delivery. Next slide. This slide shows the number and variety of referral services and programs an older adult may be referred to. In this table, MAP is the state's name for the AD, their ADRCs. SC is Senior Care, which is a state program that offers a number of supports to frail elders. HP is Health Promotion Programs, and SHIP is the State Health Information and Assistance Program. As you can see, every program across the aging network is part of the solution. The answer to malnutrition and food insecurity is more than a referral to the meals program and a dietitian, although those two steps are often very helpful. Every staff member in your organization can play a role. Next slide. This final table demonstrates how documentation of your agency, of how your agency addresses the social determinants of health can assist with billing and payment issues. And these models for malnutrition can be used for other conditions such as diabetes or high blood pressure because all of those conditions are affected by the social determinants of health. So this model can work for any condition your organization may screen for. You don't have to duplicate processes based on the type of condition you want to address. Now I'll turn the presentation over to Kathy so she can introduce our upcoming speakers. Thanks, Judy. Speaker is Pam Van Campen. Pam is a registered dietitian nutritionist. As I mentioned, she is the Older Americans Act consultant nutrition specialist and senior center representative at the Greater Wisconsin Agency on Aging. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Pam. Thank you, Kathy, and thank you, Judy, for setting the table. We have a lot to cover, and I'm going to kind of present a brief menu of services, if you will. So next slide. So the older Americans I'm sorry, older adult malnutrition is a critical health and public safety issue according to Defeat Malnutrition Today. And if you're not aware of Defeat Malnutrition Today, I would encourage you to join. It's a coalition of peers of all sizes and they have their finger on the pulse of everything malnutrition. They'll provide you with all the updates monthly um, on advocacy, resources. So please consider joining the movement and join Defeat Malnutrition today. Next slide, please. Um, just briefly, malnutrition has been defined as an imbalance, including undernutrition and overnutrition. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more, but it is a leading cause of morbidity and mortality among older adults. And it doesn't discriminate. It can affect every one of us. And I bet we all have a, a calling, if you will. That's why we're on the call today, because malnutrition resonates with us in some degree. Next slide. So no one wants to become or identified as malnutrition, as malnourished. Um, I like to use the analogy as I thought that incontinence was the last taboo, but I believe that malnutrition is the last taboo in healthcare that we need to overcome. In 1974, um, C. Butterfield talked about malnutrition being a skeleton in the closet. And sadly, 40 years later, it is still a significant problem in um, our communities. And the statistics are shocking. 
So again, Defeat Malnutrition has a, a multitude of helpful infographics available. This is one of them, and it's from their state legislative toolkit. Um, up to one in two older adults are either at risk of becoming malnourished or are malnourished. And you can see the devastating cost and effects of this condition. Next slide. You can identify with where your state's at. We have far too many green states and orange states. Um, so let's try to change the color of this map. Uh, it, the cost, not econ only economically, but emotionally on our country is, is too great. And we can make a difference, each of us. Next slide. So what's your why? Um, malnutrition has affected my life personally. It's a deep personal issue to me. Um, so do you have your story? How has malnutrition affected you, your clients, or your family? And if you think, oh, I don't think malnutrition has affected me, well, you may change your answer at the end of this presentation. And if you do have a story to tell, please um, record it on the Defeat Malnutrition Today website. They use those stories. Stories are powerful. Stories are advocacy. Um, and we use their form and the idea of it, and we created a Wisconsin Stories and Testimonials form that we are using actually after um, our stepping up in nutrition classes to collect even more data and then to follow up and provide additional resources. Next slide. So what does malnutrition look like? It can look like any of these pictures. We can be obese and malnourished. We can be undernourished. We can be normal weight and be malnourished. Um, the stats are one in three older adults is obese or overweight. Next slide. Just briefly want to mention this article in Pyramid. Some excellent work is being done in um, Europe, and the seven countries are working together, and they put together this, I think, brilliant model that shows the connectedness of all the different dynamics that contribute to someone becoming malnourished. And the green, the lighter green outer circle and the yellow circle, you can see where our programs um, can intervene on any one of these to help prevent the downward spiral towards someone becoming malnourished. So if we can break the chain anywhere along the way, that will be amazing. And I believe we can break the chain. So this is noted in the resources slide, so make sure you check out that article. Next slide. So there are many root causes. I like to use the tree analogy for malnutrition because I believe there's a lot of root causes. And I, I um, talk about how we might have a lightning strike event that affects the tree. And that could be something like um, pneumonia, COVID, a fall. You could have poor soil over time and that can be our chronic conditions. Or you could have a planned pruning like surgery. And it, a simple way for us, our programs, community-based organizations, is to be talking with healthcare providers, especially before planned surgeries, to provide nutrition at the front end of it, not just a week of nutrition. It doesn't take us only a week to become malnourished, and it doesn't take only a week to reverse the consequences. So we need to nourish folks before and after planned surgeries. And um, there is an excellent resource um, that Teresa Scholar put together and mentioned in the resources page. So we need to think differently. We need to dig deeply and uncover those root causes. Next slide. So when I put these together, I put them in the acronym malnourished. And when I talk about this, I like to use these little building blocks that uh, like preschoolers use. And each one of these things, um, medications and their side effects, um, memory issues, access issues, um, loss of lean body weight, limited income, live alone, all of these can be built into a wall. And then it's nice to talk about these and build the wall or have the wall built as you're talking to a group. And then as you take away some of the things, they can see that, oh my gosh, the uh, nutrition foundation is at risk when each one of these is affected. So if we have more of these um, underlying root causes, the chances of our um, nutrition 
foundation collapsing increase. So let us see what other people don't see. Let us uncover those root causes. And we as community-based organizations are perfectly poised to do that. We are the eyes and ears out there. Next slide, please. So this is an unexpected journey. And it, of course, it doesn't have to follow this pathway, but it's just an idea to help people understand and connect the dots that can happen when someone has a chronic condition and then they have started on the medicines, maybe multiple medicines, and there's side effects of those medicines that either take away their appetite, change their taste, alter their um, absorption, and that can decrease, lead to decreased appetite or decreased intake, which leads to unintentional weight loss, loss of lean muscle, and decreased strength. And now they're not able to open their jars or containers or prepare food or stand long enough to cook or even stand long enough in lines at stores to um, purchase their food. So then maybe they'll tend to go to a smaller convenience store to buy their food. And possibly some of the foods there are less nutritious. And so their nutrient intake declines. And then when that happens, they have a decreased immunity and increased inflammation that occurs that can lead to an acute um, health episode and the vicious cycle can start again. And sadly that happened to, to someone near and dear to my heart who just passed away in December because of too many of those vicious cycles happening over and over again. So we must figure out a way to find messaging that resonates with older adults. We can't just tell them you need to eat because you need to have the nutrition. Maybe we need to appeal to their vanity. Maybe we need to say you need to eat so you can have good hair. Um, whatever we need to do to reframe this conversation, we need to get creative and do it. Next slide, please. So we do have a document that I'm happy to share with you. It just summarizes all those root causes. It pulls out the research. It gives you um, resources that you can use. So maybe look when you look at your community needs health assessment or when you have a conversation with your healthcare providers to see what their points of pain are and you pull out some of those root causes they want to address, you can go to this document and then get more um, uh, ammunition, if you will, to help you make your case um, to them and on how you can intervene and provide services that help them address the, the um, conditions that they are trying to overcome as well. So we're happy to share this document with you. Next slide, please. We also, since we're all required to continue using the determine checklist and ask the 10 questions, what we did is said, okay, those determined questions are a nice um, window. They crack the window. They're a nice conversation starter. But instead of just only asking the 10 questions, recording the information into our systems and calling it good, we have an obligation, I believe, to dig deeper. So when you ask the question and they say yes, well, here's some follow-up questions you can ask. And then here is a pathway to some referrals and intervention options that can help us lead to that person-centered plan of care, which I hope we are all uh, striving to achieve. So we are just finalizing this enhanced determined checklist, and we are um, lucky enough to be partnering with Dane County Area Agency on Aging and some other um, of our Wisconsin partners uh, to, to pilot this project for a year. Um, and we're hoping to have some good outcomes from that. And, uh, and to go along with that, we'll be creating training tools as well. So again, if you're interested in this tool, happy to share it with you. Next slide, please. Um, so what does the word nourish mean to you? Um, I, I'm a big fan of this word nourish. Nourish to me means all the things that we do in the aging network. We have the perfect trifecta as we've been talking about nutrition, socialization, and well-being. We are so much more than a meal. So let's take the conversation about malnutrition and reframe it into how can we best nourish um, our participants, our older adults, and our caregivers. Next slide, please. So look at what some of the low hanging fruit can be. Some of the low hanging fruit could be people aren't eating because they can't 
um, pick up a cup, that they can't hold the equipment, they can't open their tray. Um, so look at some of the low hanging fruit, look at getting rides to stores, think about what you can do now. I know that we're all so overwhelmed, we're just coming off of this year of, of COVID and tremendous increase in the number of meals that you're served and you're thinking, I can't do one more thing. And I just ask you to think about what could be that small one more thing that you could do. Next slide, please. Use a validated screening tool. NCOA has a, a tremendous list that they've compiled of validated screening tools. And I must make you aware of one I just learned about yesterday from, the Can from Canada, from the Canadian Malnutrition Task Force. They have, um, it used to be called Screen 2, but now they've changed the name to Screen 14, Screen 8, and Screen 3. They're all designed to be community dwelling screening tools. And when in the follow-up email that we'll send or the follow-up document that we'll send, we'll provide the links to, to those sites. But they do have one that's called nutritionscreen.ca backslash e-screen nutritionscreen.ca backslash e-screen. That is designed to be a self-administered online tool that older adults and their caregivers um, could go through and, and answer the questions. And it gives you this beautiful um, uh, printout of here's what you're doing well in your diet. Here's some opportunities for improvement. And then it takes you right to resources that can help educate you further. You can email that document to yourself the, the, after you do the screen. You can share it with your healthcare provider. So I was so excited about that and just wanted to thank Dr. Keller and all the Canadian dietitians for their excellent work there as well as all the excellent work that is being done in our country by the Academy and by um, Aspen and all uh, Meals on Wheels America, Nan Asp, everybody. So thank you, thank you, thank you all. Next slide, please. Okay, Malnutrition Awareness Week is something that Aspen does every year. And this year's is October 4th through the 8th. And I would encourage you to start planning for it now and check out their website. This is one of their documents that they used. I don't know if it was last year or the year before, but we use this document in our welcome packets that we provide to all of our new um, people who come on board for the Older Americans Act Nutrition Program. It, there, it's a beautiful, a powerful, simple tool that helps people connect the dots. So please check out Malnutrition Awareness Week. Next slide. Stepping up your nutrition again from Maryland Department of Aging and the Maintaining Active um, Citizens Area Agency. It's a one time two and a half hour interactive class that talks about um, how nutrition affects falls risk. It focuses on muscle strength that really hits on nutrition and hydration and the critical role that, that those two nutrients play, as well as strength training. And if you're interested, please sign up um, or go online to learn more at, at steppingupnutrition.com. Um, it is a great way to introduce people to evidence-based classes because it follows the evidence-based format, um, but it's a one-time class. So you could be a great feeder program or follow up to any of the evidence-based classes or can be just used to stand alone. It doesn't have to go along with the evidence-based class. Next slide, please. We also have a nutrition risk jeopardy game that we came up with. And again, happy to share this with you. It's just a fun way to kind of provide information and open people's eyes on, wow, these are the malnutrition um, facts. And uh, so just wanted to mention that. Next slide, please. Uh, the Eat Well, Age Well, Eat Well, Care Well. These are dedicated to my mom, my mother-in-law, and my father-in-law and my father. Um, my dad was an, and was an intensive caregiver for my mom. And after my mom passed away, I created these tools in, in memory and honor of her. Um, and um, to help my dad who actually developed cancer after he um, was such an intensive caregiver. So these materials were created in collaboration with UW Stout dietetic students and interns and I just have to thank them for all they do. I do review and approve all of the materials. So all the materials are reviewed and approved by a registered dietitian. You can use any of them. Next slide. 
I'm going to talk about them a little bit more here in detail. This is what our GWAR website looks like. When you go to the link, you'll see this, how it's laid out. So make sure you click on the Eat Well, Age Well tab, also on the Eat Well, Care Well tabs below, and then the Beneficial Bites. And we just added cooking demonstration and videos. We have nine there so far that UW uh, Stout Dietetic interns did for us. And there are nine of the Eat Well recipes. And we also have a com compilation Eat Well cookbook with all of the recipes from the placemats and the handouts in one place that we'd encourage you to use to make your videos, use for cooking demonstrations, use for um, partnering with grocery stores, et cetera. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. If you could pop back, I'm sorry. So why we created it, we created it as an entity that was more than paper. We want the um, nutrition ed to be engaging and creative and come to life. We want to show people it can be simple and affordable to eat healthy. We wanted to teach people to fish. We don't have enough money to feed everyone that needs nutrition. So we want to teach people to fish. We want them to take the recipes and cook together on, on maybe for breakfast or evening meals or on the weekends. Um, we created uh, weekly challenges that are really action plans, but we uh, call them weekly challenges. Um, but it helps people step into what they know and, and moves them from knowing to doing. And then we have uh, the weekly placemats and table tents that actually can be used as a marketing and outreach tool. You put a new one out each week and tell people, hey, come back next week and you'll get the next um, placemat or the next table tent. And then that allows them to bring their stories back next week and say, hey, I tried the summer squash bread and it was great, or I tried it, but I added in this or that. And it, it just helps them give back to the program too. And it helps normalize healthy eating for optimal aging to the different generation. And of course, use the messaging and social media as well. Next slide, please. Um, the topics, these are just the 2021 topics. If you go on our website, you'll see multiple years listed. You'll see they're all health and wellness topics. Next slide, please. And this is just an example of what they look like. The Eat Well, Care Well document is a one document front to back that has wellness tips for the caregiver, weekly challenges for the caregiver to care for themselves, and recipes that they can use that are simple, easy, and nutritious, and can be used for support groups, cafes, memory cafes, whatever. Next slide, please. And then the Eat Well, Age Well is a monthly handout. And then next slide, please. Um, and on the back of that handout, which I wouldn't run in front to back, I would do this separate, is the instructions for your site managers so they know the role that they have to play. It says, give out this placemat, encourage um, people to talk about this, et cetera. So that's all on the back of the page. Next slide, please. And we have a tracking calendar. Again, you can use this to as a, as a, an incentive, like if you complete your weekly challenge, you'll be entered for a drawing for a prize. Or if nothing else, like I said, it helps them with their action plans. It gives them weekly challenges to accomplish that can be specific and measurable. Next slide, please. And then the table tents are designed to be printed on legal size paper. You can print them on um, letter size paper as well, but then they're designed to be folded into a triangle and then just taped so that you can set them on tables and you don't need any special equipment. And there's one for each week of the month. Next slide. And then the weekly placements, the same kind of thing. They always have a recipe. They always have a little health tip. I think what you think about is what you think about. So we think about all the messaging out there, how to properly nourish our pets, how to properly nourish our plants. Well, this is messaging so we can properly nourish ourselves. Um, next slide. Just another example. Sometimes we include quotes at the bottom so that we can nourish our emotional souls as well. Next slide. And this is one I like because I just showed that you should make the food 
um, uh, pretty. You should make the food attractive because we eat with our eyes. So when you make the food attractive and you encourage them to make it look attractive, then hopefully they're going to eat better. And plus, you could have a little photo contest. If they make the recipe on any of the menus, have them take a picture, bring it in, have a little photo contest, have a class on how to take food pictures. Um, just make it really interactive and come to life. Next slide, please. Oh, yes. And then cooking classes, cooking demos. Just I had to show you a little stuff to it's three in the afternoon, you know, get you hungry for the evening meal. Um, but bring in all your partners, ask them to do the cooking demonstrations. Make nutritious food healthy and that people are excited about. Next slide, please. And we just added a monthly bingo cards for the Eat Well, Age Well. So this has been a great thing that Heidi Russell and Sean O'County created for us and um, Naomi Mua, one of our interns, created. So we have 10 bingo cards for each month. And it's great because as the drivers give out their little um, chip of the day, they say, hey, what about that vitamin A you just read? So it gets everyone in the game. Next slide, please. And I must do a shout out to Barron County and their Beneficial Bites. Their program is seven, eight years. They focus on one food a month. So you could go through and plan out your yearly calendar based on a food, and they give you all of this material ready to use. So please check out their excellent materials on our website. And next slide, please. So, Malnutrition has many faces, many stories. I challenge us to see the whole person, look for those root causes, their unspoken needs and the barriers, listen to what people say, ask probing questions. What do you eat? Why do you eat? Who do you eat with? Um, when do you eat? Reframe the conversation to think about nourishment and nourishing people because that is what we do. We are so much more than a meal. And malnutrition is not just about food. We must screen, we must assess, educate, and intervene and step into our roles. Next slide. Resource page that you'll get. And the final slide on my, hand, on my portion before I hand it back um, is let's not imagine a country without a malnutrition. Let's think bigger, work collaboratively to ensure all seniors are nourished and have a planned journey toward health. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Thank you. Very, very creative and informative presentation. Next slide. Our next speaker, Paul Pepper. Paul is the Chief Executive Officer at Project Open Hand. Paul's going to share with us today um, th what they're doing with medically tailored meals and also the importance of partnerships and lessons learned. With that, Paul, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Kathy, and thank you, Pamela, for your presentation. Really glad to be here with you all this afternoon, I suppose, for most of you. Um, and, and I really appreciate you sitting in on a yet another virtual presentation. I know we've all had so many of these in this past 11 and a half months. Um, I know for myself, I um, do, giving virtual presentations, I find that I notice things on my slides when I'm looking at them uh, ver that I didn't notice when I stand in front of them in, in, for in-person presentations. Like this slide, you'll see my HIV red ribbon on my lapel is sideways. And I just noticed that a couple weeks ago and I've tried to Photoshop it, but every time I use this photo, somehow it reverts back to the original. So I, I suppose um, the, the pandemic has caused me to pay better attention to my slides. So thanks again for being here. Next slide. Uh, for my presentation, I'll, I'll, I'll share with you a little bit about uh, the Food is Medicine Coalition of California and the National Food is Medicine Coalition. Uh, and given that it's National Nutrition Month, I think it's particularly important to share with you a little bit about the history of Project Open Hand and how we began, because I think it's really uh, indicative of, of where we're at today in nutrition and how important it is in the, in the lives of our older adults. We'll talk a little bit, I will talk a little bit about medically tailored meals, what, what they are, our definition of those, and, and how we are working in California and in some cases nationally to advance medically tailored meals 
the the service and the benefits and and try and um, obtain medical reimbursement for these. And then I'll also talk really about the importance of partnerships and some of the lessons that we've learned these last few years and particularly these last few months during the pandemic. So next slide, please. So for starters, uh, we, we like to use this pyramid to really give you all a little bit of grounding when you hear my colleagues talk about medically tailored meals and a medically tailored meal program. We're really talking about this top part of the pyramid and, and we focus this intervention really for people who have complex chronic health issues that are in need of this type of really specialized diet. This might include people with HIV, heart disease, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, malnutrition. We, in the last presentation, Pamela talked about that. Um, in, um, kidney disease and end-stage renal disease. And, and you'll see that, that as you progress the pyramid, as, as someone's health uh, becomes more challenging, as you go up the pyramid, the, the intervention becomes more specialized. So at Project Open Hand, we provide a number of services throughout this pyramid, but really right now I'm, I'm mainly for this presentation focusing on the medically tailored meals portion. Next slide, please. So here's the definition we use to talk about medically tailored meals, and I'll just read the first sentence there for you. Medically tailored meals are meals approved by a registered dietitian that reflect appropriate dietary therapy based on evidence-based practice guidelines. And we found in the last 12 months during COVID that it's been really important for us to emphasize this message even more than before. Uh, the, the pandemic exposed how food insecure our many adults and, and citizens are in this country. And that is really exacerbated for people with complex health issues. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit more in a minute about um, nutrition security versus food security. But this is the definition we use when we talk to our partners and we try and encourage people to understand medically tailored meals. This really helps ground them in the, um, oh, I'm sorry, someone said they can't hear me. I'll try and talk a little louder. Okay, and next slide, please. Can, uh, can you hear me now? Is, it, is, is this better? I'm hoping so. I'm going to keep going, hoping that you can oh. hear me. Paul, I can hear yes. you. Okay, great. You're good. Okay, great. Good. Very good. Thanks. All right. So now uh, to give you a little background about Project Open Hand in San Francisco, uh, really, we spent the last year celebrating our 35th anniversary. And before the pandemic, we had so many plans about events we were going to do, fundraising events, community gatherings throughout the Bay Area. Uh, and, and literally a year ago next week is when we received the shelter in place order that, uh, that rocked all of our worlds really and, and changed much of our, our service enhancements. So Project Open Hand began 35 years ago. On the left side of this, pan this photo, you'll see our founder, Ruth Brinker, who was a retired food service employee 35 years ago. And, and you all know, probably are, are guessing that 35 years ago was the outbreak of HIV AIDS in this country. And Ruth Brinker was a resident of San Francisco, and she noticed a, a young man living in her neighborhood who was literally starving to death as a result of HIV and AIDS. And at no point in our history was the fear, stigma, and bigotry towards people with HIV greater than it was at the beginning. And, and this, this young man had no access to nutrition and he was literally wasting away. So she decided to do something about it. And she started cooking meals out of her own kitchen and delivering meals to this young man. And pretty soon other people in the neighborhood and in the city saw that she was doing this and pointed her towards other people who needed food. Uh, she opened up her kitchen for volunteers to come in and, and help prepare meals. And they mobilized themselves as volunteers to get nutrition out to these individuals who were uh, suffering really at the, the, the height of the HIV AIDS outbreak. And the, the reason this is so poignant in March, um, you know, it, it struck us last year during the shelter in place as, as, as employees and as my coworkers here at Project Open Hand, 
you know, there, there, there was a brief period of time we thought, well, what are we going to do? Can we keep our kitchens open? We do a million meals a year now, and we have 17 senior nutrition sites, and we had just received the shelter in place order. And it really, looking back now, I think having Ruth's legacy as our, as our North Star during this was so poignant for us to really help us get through the last 12 months. So over the, over the years, the 35 years that we've been um, in operation, several years after the, the outbreak of HIV AIDS, we found that our clients that were receiving our medically tailored nutrition were healthier. And we had requests from other community members and from medical providers to provide our intervention for people with other complex chronic health issues like congestive heart failure, diabetes, uh, cancer, and some other, um, some other health conditions. Next slide, please. So we, we um, in, in the early days, a, a church opened up to Project Open Hand and we began preparing meals out of the church and we outgrew that. And now we are located in San Francisco in the Tenderloin in a four story building that we own outright. We have a community health clinic above us that is a partner of ours but we produce all of our medically tailored meals right here in our building, which I said is about a million a year. We have a variety of, of diet offerings. We have a renal diet, we have a CKD diet, we have a heart healthy diet, a diabetic diet, a vegetarian diabetic diet. And then we also provide a larger scale um, pre-COVID catering style to 16 different senior sites throughout San Francisco. Next slide, please. And there are many organizations that had a similar beginning as Project Open Hand. We have members of the, the National Food is Medicine Coalition, which you'll hear about all over the country in, in Washington, D.C., uh, Philadelphia, Boston, um, um, uh, Los Angeles, our partners here in California, who had a similar beginning in the HIV space and transitioned into providing medically tailored meals to people with other uh, other other health conditions. In California, several years ago, we came together with our partners and formed the California Food is Medicine Coalition because we really saw the value in us taking this message and this model out together to try and secure uh, healthcare dollars and, and reimbursement for, for this intervention. So right now in California, there are six members of our coalition. As you see here, we reach about 48% of the state and together we have over 150 year combined um, service experience, really focusing on people with multiple chronic health conditions. Next slide, please. And over and over again, our partners and, and uh, along with us, we really like to emphasize the concept of nutrition security and not just food security. And this was reinforced last March when uh, infusion of federal dollars, part of COVID relief, was coming out to states and there was a recognition of people are sheltering in place now they need more food or they need food because they can't get out to get it because they're trying to maintain their safety well we at, at the state our coalition at the state level talked about how important it is to get not just for the food security but we have a lot of people with complex chronic health issues that don't just need food they need the right type of food for their particular health conditions and we found this to be really a challenge more and more over the years where, you know, we talked a little earlier in the last two presentations about uh, food security screens. And, you know, it's great to have a screen that can help people in the community identify food insecurity. But we really think that we need to take that further and we need to be able to screen for nutrition security. We do have clients that come in our facility and we have to use a, you know, a, a shortened version of the food security screen. And we have people that are dealing with heart disease, HIV, and maybe diabetes. And because they, they had access to some food pantry or some sort of community food that's being available on the street, they might screen as food secure. And we know they're not. And we know they're certainly not nutritionally secure. So this is an area that we're particularly keen on advancing this concept and really working with communities to see how we can better focus on nutrition security. Next slide, please. 
So here's the here's the how the state of California looks, uh, and and some of our partners that that are part of the coalition, all the way down to, in, in the south and San Diego, and all the way up to Marin County, Sonoma, Napa, Santa Clara County, part of um, part of Silicon Valley. We are looking at expanding our coalition. We know that the central part of California, although there might be a very, very good senior nutrition programs and some Meals on Wheels programs, we know that there needs to be more coverage of medically tailored nutrition. So we have a couple partners in the Central Valley and east of here that we're working with to, to help bring them into the coalition over the next couple of years. Next slide. So this is really exciting. Part of what, when we talk about the importance of coalition, when we came together as the California Food is Medicine Coalition, we get we we went out and we talked to our local assembly members and some state senators and talked about how important it was to to really advance the science of medically tailored meals and nutrition. We had some smaller studies that we were a part of, peer reviewed studies, and that that some of our national FIMIC partners were part of. But we really needed more data to support a medically tailored meal approach as a covered benefit. So we. Uh, several years ago, we approached the state of California and a three-year pilot was, it says four-year here because we're still in it, um, was funded for people with congestive heart failure. And the idea was to take people that were hospitalized and released and provide them with the medically tailored meal intervention and follow them and the researchers would follow them afterwards to see the impact on their health and, and healthcare utilization. We, we had originally intended this to be a, a study for CHF and diabetes, but, but the uh, individuals with congestive heart failure um, have some of the highest cost and highest readmission rates in our, in our system, in our Medicaid system. So the Department of Healthcare Services um, encouraged us to, to do it for that population. So that, that study is winding down in the next few months. We can't talk about the results yet or even what we're seeing but we're optimistic uh, of what we will find. And when the, when the study is released, we'll, we'll be able to, to release that and, and share it with everyone as part of this. And, and already, even while this study is underway, we've had a number of health plans come to the coalition and say, you know, we don't need to wait for this large 1,000 person. We've seen enough of the science already. We know a medically tailored meal program works. We, we understand and appreciate the difference between just providing a healthy meal and pairing it with the registered dietitian nutrition counseling. We value that part of it and we want to contract with you to, to deliver that. And so we, we've had some success with managed care plans, um, the, the larger county managed care plans, some private health insurance companies, and, and we have a number of small pilots on the, underway and we have a number of health plans and health providers that are there. They don't need a pilot. They know that this is a covered benefit that they want to make available to their members. And so we're, we're in the process of contracting with them. Next slide, please. And as part of the coalition, here's some of the, the background um, on, on just the reach that we actually do have. Um, very diverse clientele. Uh, most of them are older adults. Most of them are or uh, under the poverty line, on the federal poverty line, when you take into consideration the, the California poverty level, um, these, these individuals are very, very low income and, and really struggle with maintaining housing in a high market area. And definitely one of the first things that's sacrificed is not just food, but the food someone needs to maintain their health. Next slide, please. We'll provide you some links to the California Food is Medicine Coalition website, and there's also the National Food is Medicine Coalition website, and most of the research is posted there, which I encourage you to, to look at. But it's, it's, really, it's really compelling, and we've had a few randomized trials. Um, we've had, most of this has been peer reviewed. Um, you know, some of the earliest research we did was on medication adherence for people with HIV. Um, we're, we're seeing uh, a reduction in hospitalizations, definitely decline in healthcare costs, uh, and, and then obviously this, the satisfaction for clients. So more research to come on 
there's two big studies that'll probably be released next year, but already it's, it's pretty compelling. Next slide. So, you know, we, I talked about the, that we've done this work together and I can't overemphasize how important it was to have a coalition of people throughout a geographic area that, that were well-respected service providers in the community really without us being able to go to our policymakers and uh, funders with, with shared data and a shared approach to how we were delivering services, we really never would have been able to make the, the strides we have already with, with state funding for pilots, but also individual health plans see this strength as a coalition and, um, and understand that we can take on task and figure things out and make this happen together. Next slide, please. Oops, yeah, there we go. Some of the, the folks we work with at the state level, obviously the State Department of Healthcare Services, the, the California State Department of Aging, uh, helping to advise the master plan on um, calling out the difference between just food security and nutrition security and medically tailored meals as a service, uh, in some cases in lieu of services, and, and how that is actually a healthcare intervention. We do regular briefings, even, even during COVID, we're doing virtual briefings with our elected officials at the state and national level. Uh, we work with our, very closely with our AAAs in Alameda County and San Francisco County, particularly during COVID. Uh, that, that's just, that partnership has been just incredibly important. Uh, one quick anecdote that's really for you all to know, I mentioned we have 16 senior meal sites here in San Francisco. And when we had to, when we, during the shelter in place order, we had to switch from hot daily meals to frozen and we had nowhere to put these meals. So the, the, the county, city county here helped us fund a, a 40 foot freezer trailer that's literally outside my window here, hardwired into our building. It's in the street it's been here since shelter in place and it can store 20,000 frozen meals. We also installed another walk-in freezer in our basement here in San Francisco that's about 700 square feet, which is bigger than most apartments in San Francisco, and that also has 20,000 meals. We, we had to triple our production during COVID, and without the partnership with uh, the Department of Aging Services here in San Francisco, we wouldn't have been able to do that. So working together it was just critically important. And then also Project Open Hand has a new grant with ACL um, to, to look at how we can provide remote RD counseling and nutrition education outside of our city limits, which we've all had to, uh, we've all had to transition to. We have a partnership with FEMA. And then of course, um, this is a big one here. We, we are excited about the potential for a federal bill that will fund CMS to provide a 10 state study for um, medically tailored nutrition. So we're really, that hasn't been introduced yet, but when that does um, go out, we'll, we'll keep everyone posted about that because that will really build more data for CMS to consider medically tailored nutrition as a national covered benefit. Uh, one more sli slide, please. Next slide. Uh, so, you know, some more um, just information here on different partners we work with. Uh, we, Project Open Hand several years ago assembled a, what we call our medically advised, medical advisory council made up of registered dietitians, physicians, researchers from different sectors. Uh, and we, we meet quarterly and we talk about uh, evaluation metrics. We talk about how do we build the case for healthcare providers. And we've recently expanded that medical advisory council. It, it's now the medical, medical advisory council for the whole California Food is Medicine Coalition. And we have representation throughout the whole state, which not only does that help us refine and improve our services, but we also build champions that are outside of our coalition that, that can sign on to letters of support and do white papers and, and really be real important advocates for us. Next slide. There we go. Uh, and of course, we work with, with food banks, food suppliers. We have Project Open End. We have thousands of volunteers a year, and, and um, a lot of philanthropy has been really important partners with us. 
Uh, last slide, please. And then, uh, you know, it's really important for us to, as you talk about coalitions and coalition building and sustaining coalition, this type of work really takes time and you have to be committed to it. You have to be committed to work together and realize that other priorities come into play, uh, that you have, to, you have to manage your day to day work and funding and operations. But, it's, but if, you, if you neglect the coalition and your partnerships, you, you really lose ground. So we're, we, we believe in that nationally and on a state level and even locally here working with our other food providers is, is just critically, critically important. And last slide. If you have any questions later, I think uh, Nicole or Kathy have an avenue for you to ask them. I'm really happy, I would be happy to talk to any of you or respond, or if you're ever in San Francisco, we'd be happy to set you up with some volunteer activities here, chop 500 pounds of carrots or uh, come in for a tour. So thank you very much, Kathy and Judy. Thank you, Paul. Be careful, you might have a whole lot of volunteers show, show up at your door. Um, just quickly, I know we're at time, but I, I do want to take a moment and thank all the three of our speakers for sharing their perspective on food insecurity and malnutrition. Um, Judy, Pam, and Paul, great job. You all really hit it out of the park. Um, I just can't thank you enough, and I, I know that our attendees also have really benefited from your presentation today. I do want to encourage everyone to go to the Celebrate National Senior Nutrition Program webpage. Do sign up for next week's webinar. The topic is again, trifecta part two, and this is on socialization. Also, while you're on the website, be sure and take a look at the incredible tools and the resources that we have. As a reminder, we did record the presentation. So the recording and the PowerPoint slides will be available to you. It will take several days, so do check back if when, you, when you're there, you don't see them. And with that, I, I have one closing thought. I do want to um, really capture a quote from Pam. Let us see what others don't see. We are the eyes and the ears. Let's do our part. Let's stop food insecurity and malnutrition. With that, thank you for your participation. Remember, all questions should be sent to Nicole Becerra, and please indicate for which speaker. With that, thank you, and we'll see you next week.